This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have a legend. That's right. One of the multi talented journalists, entrepreneurs, and of course, the host of In Depth, one of the best podcasts that I listen to because he's the only guy I know that gets better guests than me. And that's saying <laughs> something. Graham Bezing <laughs> Bensinger, thank you so much for joining me, Dave Meltzer, here on the Playbook. How are you? Great. Thanks. Appreciate you having me, David. Yeah. You know, it's so much fun to have you on because we've kind of been playing in the same space, but we got here in completely different ways, which I think is so important for entrepreneurs to learn. You know, there's no direct path to what you want, uh, but there is, I think, a direct perspective to get to where you want to be. Um, so I'd like to start out with that perspective of when you were younger and, you know, what was it that led you to where you are today of being a great journalist and a, a, a media host? Uh, so, uh, first, uh, I think you're being generous in some of your uh, c kind words, but nonetheless, I, I, so I'm 34. I used to be one of these kids in, you know, middle school who would run down to the ballpark here in St. Louis, where I was born and raised and still live to wait for uh, baseball players to get their autographs. And so, uh, developed a baseball card store on the internet, sold packs of cards through eBay, kind of taught myself how to develop a website and come eighth grade, I realized I didn't really care about getting autographs. I just like meeting the players and hearing their stories. So I'm thinking to myself, how can I figure out another way to do this? So I got the idea for an internet uh, sports radio show and sent out 50 letters to former baseball players and Hall of Famers. Got a few responses. Uh, Ernie Banks called Bob Feller, Tim McCarver, and Will Clark. And this is eighth grade at the time. Don't have a, a cell phone. You know, they call my parents' house. My mom or dad would answer and yell back to me and say, so-and-so's on the phone. And so <laughs> just kind of started from there. And then, uh, you know, developed a show on the internet, got on a local station in St. Louis in high school, and then started doing uh, one-off TV pieces for ESPN on a national level going into my freshman year of college. And so, um, Long story short, uh, did that for a few years, worked for NBC for a year after that. And then uh, March of 2009, which was when I was 22, uh, I'd left college predating that after a year and a half of school because I was getting good work opportunities. And all of a sudden, I'm laid off of uh, NBC. And, uh, you know, I, I, it had never really crossed my mind developing a business, you know, anything on the entrepreneurship front. Uh, but I, I was faced with the reality that I didn't have the resume to warrant anybody giving me the type of show that I was looking for to tell these long form stories and really profile somebody. And it's the height of the Great Recession. So I just thought, let's see if I can figure out how to do it on my own. And so that was, you know, as a 22 year old kid just laid off living in my old bedroom at my parents' house, realizing if it wasn't this, I needed to find a, a real job. This childhood hobby, you know, was either going to turn into a career or I, I needed to wake up. So that was kind of the moment where I just decided I'd give it a shot. Two things come to mind when you tell me that, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, one mentorship, you know, you live in St. Louis, one of my favorite sports commentators of all time. You know, I know everyone knows his son, but I grew up on Jack Buck. Uh, and I spent a lot of times as I worked for Major League Baseball before I went to law school, um, not in the media side, but just inadvertently running into him. And what a huge personality and effect and impact that he had on my life. Who were some of the mentors either there locally or nationally that inspired you to continue, you know, with things not going your way to think that you could do that? Yeah, I, I mean, so actually two uh, broadcasting kind of legends uh, have strong connections to St. Louis. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, Jack Buck, who is, uh, you know, the late broadcaster, still about as famous as it gets in St. Louis. But uh, his son, Joe, uh, you know, who lives in St. Louis, uh, and then uh, Bob Costas, who did play-by-play -play for the KMOX radio station here in town back in the day. His uh, son actually went to uh, high school with me, was a year above me. Um, and, and so both have been so nice to me over the years. Uh, interestingly, I was a board operator uh, my freshman year of high school at a local radio station. And I wanted to figure out a way to 
uh, get Joe Buck for my internet radio show that I was, uh, you know, hosting on the side. So, you know, I knew he was calling an uh, NFL game in Philadelphia at the time. So I called uh, every, um, you know, like five star hotel around Philadelphia asking for Joe Buck. And sure enough, I was able to get him on the phone. Um, uh, he, he couldn't talk then, but he said, like, you know, call back and leave me a message. I'm like, OK, I'm going to call back and leave a message, but I'm never going to get a return call. And uh, then sure enough, a, a few days later, I get a call back from him saying he'd be happy to come on my radio show. So, uh, you know, he over the years has gone out of his way to be nice to me. Uh, Bob Costas actually uh, wrote my recommendation letter to uh, Syracuse University where uh, I, I went to school. And so, you know, I when people reach out and ask me for advice, uh, I, I tell them all the time, you know, if there's somebody whose career you really respect and whose, you know, advice you would love to get, just reach out. Um, I mean, you know, it might take a few messages to get a response and, you know, not everybody's going to respond, but if you reach out, you know, and, and come up with a creative enough response and cast a wide enough net, you're going to have the opportunity to talk to some really, you know, important folks and uh, people are generally pretty generous with their, their time. And so um, I did a lot of that and that helped me a ton early on and I, I still do it today. Yeah, you uh, are definitely an expert at asking, which is, I think, one of the hurdles that so many young entrepreneurs, so many young media hosts are afraid of that radical humility that it takes to say, hey, and the funniest thing is most people are not only complimented by you asking to feature them on your show, uh, but it also plays towards their ego because they're usually talking about their favorite subject, which is themselves. And it's a lot easier to do that as well. Um, but you do go ahead. No, yeah, and the, the other thing is, I feel like, especially today, uh, everybody's quick to just send an email or a DM on Instagram, or, you know, if you are lucky enough to get the person's cell phone number, you just send a text message. There is something to be said still for, like, picking up the phone and calling somebody or leaving a voicemail, or, or even though this isn't the most efficient way, like, writing a handwritten letter and mailing it, like, just anything that can distinguish yourself a little bit uh, makes a difference. Yeah, and I, I tell people all the time, I call it toughness and telephone because one of my superpowers is I like to call people. Like, and I like to use messages and see how statistically successful I am at getting people to call me back, which I think is that toughness and the superpower. It's not just making the phone call. It's like, how good are you at getting people to call you back? But if anyone out there, look at the difference between your email, your DMs, or any type of interaction digitally compared to how many voicemails you have, right? I, I have thousands of communications, people asking me to be on the show, people asking to be on my shows, thousands right. a day. Right. And I will look at my phone today and I will tell you I have zero voicemails and I give my cell phone out, even on shows sometimes just to prove people, I'll say, hey, I'm gonna give you my cell phone and all of you are too chicken to call me. Don't text me because I get a thousand texts too, but go ahead, call me. And if I don't answer, leave a voicemail and you'd be amazed, nobody calls. Uh, the second thing that came to mind though, is you know something that I call the aggregate effect. You know, It takes 90% of our effort to get to 25% of the way there. That's why there's really no competition for people like you and I that aren't willing to quit. And so I'd love for you to explain you know, the early days when you're sitting at home in your old room and everyone's laughing at you, scoffing at you, making fun of you, you drop out of Syracuse, one of the best schools in the country, right? right? And here, here, you were not an overnight success. I can guarantee it. Nobody starts a show and, you know, especially at your age and all of a sudden, you know, there's millions and millions of viewers like you have today. What was that process like and what kept you going to get to the aggregate effect, the compound interest of viewership yep. that you have today? Well, it's a very weird dynamic for me, but you know, back then, like 22, 23 years old, because in the few years predating that, I had done a couple interviews that got a lot of exposure. And so all of a sudden I'm on the Tonight Show or I'm on Conan O'Brien, or, you know, I'm hosting a Sirius XM show and, and have ha had some opportunities that got a lot of exposure. So of course, like all my friends, you know, think I'm like this resounding, 
you know, success. Imagine. And, and in reality, I got laid off, you know, had no money, had no career prospects. And so it was just this weird kind of mental, you know, game. And so um, I was just, you know, motivated from the standpoint of, I, I didn't want to, you know, feel like, or be a failure. And I, I, this, I know I really enjoyed doing these interviews and wanted to just figure out a way to do it. So, you know, for me at the time, all I knew how to do was conduct a half decent interview and book a guest. I had no idea what was involved with putting a show together and our show, uh, you know, it's on uh, television on ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox stations across the country. We have uh, air internationally on, you know, ESPN, YouTube, Facebook, in taxis, et cetera. So have a handful of distribution platforms, but uh, I, I didn't know the first thing about what's involved with signing on a TV station or, you know, how are we going to get uh, funded? We need sponsors and, you know, companies to buy ad time. How do you go about getting a, a, a sponsor? And, uh, you know, initially we have a team of like 10, 12, you know, folks now, but uh, initially I was doing all of that by myself. And, you know, even now I, I still have a lot of involvement in, you know, the, the sales, whether it's signing on a big distribution platform or signing on a big sponsor or booking a big guest. Uh, but, you know, I, I remember this is like October of 2009. I would uh, get up every morning at four and you know, work till I think 10 o'clock at night, like six days a week, half days on, on Sundays. And that entire month, all I did was send emails to heads of companies or heads of marketing for companies trying to get them to sponsor my show, you know, knowing uh, for sure, I, I didn't know how to structure a deal or the amount to ask for or whatever. I just thought if I sent enough emails out, perhaps I would get the occasional call where I'd start to learn terminology and, you know, what to ask for and et cetera. And so, you know, after six, seven, eight months of doing that, I got the first sponsor to, you know, make a nominal commitment. And then that allowed me to get a second sponsor and third sponsor, because once you get one, it makes it easier to get the others. And then we were kind of off to the races. And you've done so many great interviews over the years, even before you started the show. Um, I always like to ask, who's your favorite interview and why? Oh. Or one I, of your so favorite I, and why? Yeah, I, I have a, a couple for different reasons. Um, one, uh, you know, on the sports front, I've uh, sat down with Jim Brown on a few occasions before. Uh, a couple times at his home in the Hollywood Hills, which, you know, for those who aren't, you know, diehard sports fans, uh, aside from being arguably the greatest football player ever to live, he's certainly one of the most socially significant athletes of the past century. You know, this is a guy who called uh, Hugh Hefner, Richard Pryor, um, Frank Sinatra, Jack Nicholson, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King Jr., you know, friends over the years. So he has unbelievable stories. The FBI spies tracked him for the better portion of a decade because they viewed him as a political threat. So, uh, you know, he's older now walks with a cane, but uh, quick to tell you if you ask a stupid question and, you know, could still kick my, you know, what, 10 times over. So you kind of are always on the edge a little bit when going into a conversation with him, but it's always a treat. Um, the other one, uh, Sir Richard Branson, uh, I, I had been trying to book for an episode of the show for like five years. And, you know, we, we request anywhere from a few hours to parts of a couple of days, depending on uh, who it is we're you, you know, featuring and his person rightly said, you know, you're never going to get Richard to sit down for more than, you know, 20 or 30 minutes it just isn't going to happen. And of course, in the back of my head, I'm like, we're only going to have one shot to do this. So if we're going to do this, I, I want to make sure we have the right, uh, you know, setup. So um, I randomly uh, run into him at his uh, lodge. He has these hotels all over the world at his lodge in North Africa. Um, I, I had a couple of days to kill when I was in Europe before flying back to the States, wanted to go hiking, uh, guaranteed good weather, late October there. So I'm like, uh, you know, I'll go there, randomly run into him there, uh, go up, introduce myself. He invites me to play uh, chess with him, tennis with him, uh, dinner and drinks uh, that night with him and his personal assistant. And then a month later, we we're with him for a week in the Bahamas uh, taping the episode, which was just like one of those all time great booking stories. It felt completely out of place having that sort of 
access to him. You know, I think the day before that, he was having dinner with Prince Mohammed of Saudi Arabia, who at the time was, uh, you know, an investor in Virgin Galactic, his, you know, space program. So, uh, yeah, that's another one that was just uh, such a treat and felt so lucky to have that sort of access. That, that is amazing. It's so funny that you say that because I was speaking at the UN with Richard Branson and wanted to meet him and ask him to be on the podcast. And he was speaking, I was on next and they call me to come in from the green room and I'm kind of late. Cause I was on the phone with my wife, you know, how you're in there and you're not paying attention. So I hang up, I run out the door and I literally, when you say you ran into Richard Branson, I ran into him. He's not a big guy. I knocked him onto his butt. Oh no. no. I ran into Richard Branson and I'm like, Hey, Richard, I'm Dave Meltzer. And I'm like picking him up. Like, I got to go speak, but I love to talk to you about getting my podcast. I don't think I made quite the impression you did. I didn't get the invite. I have been invited to Richter Island, but I haven't got the invite to get him on, but I only need 20 minutes of his time. So we'll see what happens. Say, at least you left an impression though. I don't oh, and a only bruise. remember you. <laughs> and a bruise. And <laughs> yeah. you know, just the opposite, as you know, running into Jim Brown, I would have been on my butt. And uh, he was also, as you know, as a Syracuse fan, probably the greatest lacrosse player of all time. Uh, you know, and Paul Rabel and I speak about that. Uh, m- moving forward to, though, you know, lessons in general. When you are in Napoleon Hill of the modern day media, which you are, you're able to have access to the spirit of excellence, as I call it. What's the common denominator that you see amongst all the people that you get to interview the what i call the spirit of excellence this extra overachievers of the world what what is that one thing that you've learned seems to be a common denominator between them uh oh one thing it's not in my opinion is intellect i i don't think you have to be you know the smartest person out there to have a ton of success uh for me what i've seen is work ethic uh, and, you know, unrelenting self-belief, um, you know, even, even if it's not, uh, overt, um, you know, all seem to have just this underlying self-confidence and belief in their ability to do it. And, you know, if you're the, the best of the best, it's because you've, you know, busted your ass to get there and, you know, you were putting in as many or more hours than anybody. So uh, f- for me, that those have always been my takeaways and kind of the, the common thread with, uh, you know, generally every really successful person that we, you know, feature. I mean, certainly, you, you know, you can't be a, a, a dummy to do that, but I, I don't think you have to be the smartest person out there to achieve a a ton of success either. Yeah. I think there's different types of intelligence that I found throughout there and academic intelligence isn't necessary. It's funny when you reflect on what those qualities are and characteristics are, I actually, you know, and I don't mean this to be offensive or complimentary. Do you see yourself that way having those characteristics? Uh, Well, I am certainly not the brightest person out there. I uh, <laughs> try and make sure That's I, have I was not. afraid to ask, but I wanted I, to ask because I, no, I, I was I, almost I, thinking, does he see himself this way too? Because he uh, does have the spirit of excellence. Well, I, I, I mean, and also I, I have a long, long way to go to kind of a, a achieve my goals. But, you know, I try and have, I, I read a ton, try and have a basic understanding to be able to get dropped in any situation and at least comfortably, you know, hold my own. Uh, But, you know, on the interview front, or just on the kind of talent front of, you know, when you're viewed as a host, you know, nobody was ever going to give me, uh, you know, a a hosting gig of the caliber that I wanted. I mean, there are far more people out there that, you know, present better, that, uh, you know, look better on camera, Etc. Uh, I, I think the one thing that I've always had going for me, aside from just the hours invested in building this, is we put just a ton of preparation into each conversation preceding the sit down. I mean, we probably put a uh, hundred hours of research into each interview uh, ahead of time. Now, granted, you know, I have the benefit of only doing a handful of these uh, every year, but 
I think it's just time investment and preparation that has allowed me to continue getting uh, opportunities that I otherwise really had no business ever getting. Which is incredible. And it's so nice because as you know, media and content is changing so quickly and it's nice to see someone that has full productions, me, myself, not doing that because this wasn't my primary uh, interest. And yet it's probably one of the favorite things I get to do. And I get to do it, you know, seven days a week, but luckily it's 20 minutes uh, without hundreds of hours of preparation. <laughs> uh, and the quality of the content shows that comparatively, which is but, fine. I mean, there's place place for all of it, you know? I mean, it's, uh, you know, your, your value proposition is uh, aside from, you know, getting the top talent, you have a, a very distinct perspective and there's, you know, a common... Uh, tonality and themes of, you know, every, every conversation. Um, we, uh, you know, do not even a fraction of the, the conversations that you're able to do. But because of that, we need to put in, you know, more resource and, and, and time since we do so few of them. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's places... We're, we're per perfect complement to each other. <laughs> right, there you go. All right, last question. You know, through that transition uh, with media, which we both have seen, you just started a lot earlier than I did in, in sports content, especially. I'm just lucky I'm 53 years old and have lived now enough to see this uh, transformation that's occurred. What do you see for the up and coming generation for sports media, particularly? You know, where, where do you see it going? Uh, huh, you know, that's interesting. First, I, I mean, I guess there are two paths you can take in, in responding to that. One, just in terms of, you know, people who want to have careers in, you know, sports journalism, uh, I, I think, you know, they should be, they should care less about platforms coming out of school and more uh, about opportunity to develop their craft. I, I think so often, you know, young folks or students when they're coming out, you know, want to get employed by whatever big name company it is that, you know, sounds good to them or the, the flavor of the month. Um, you shouldn't worry about any of that. You should just worry about putting yourself in situations where you continue to develop as, a, you know, a, a, a talent. Um, I do think, though, it's going to be really interesting to see how uh, sports rights continue to evolve. And as linear television's declining and uh, the audience sizes continue to fraction and you just saw, you know, Fox give up Thursday night football a year earlier than planned to Amazon, um, you know, the streamers are already playing a ton internationally with these rights fees, starting to do more domestically. Uh, I think that'll be really interesting to see how it evolves over the next uh, several years. And I, I think Amazon certainly seems to be at the, the forefront of that change. Yeah, it's crazy when more people are watching a streamer on Thursday night football, watching Thursday night football, than watching Thursday night football on TV. We know there's a huge change coming. And I always think my now 11 year old when he was six, because the biggest investment I have is in overactive media, which is going public, you know, a huge franchise in Toronto for esports. And when he told me that they sell out arenas when he was six, we're going to the NBA finals with, with the Curry and LeBron game seven. I looked at him like, dude, they don't go to arenas and watch people play video games. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. And thank God he did because I researched esports six years ago and uh, changed my investment life forever. The greatest investment in my life, I literally thought I was going to lose all my money. That just goes to show you. Really? Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's amazing. I, for, for the life of me, I still don't understand why somebody can sit in front of their computer all day watching somebody else play video games, but yeah. Uh, or now somebody else I, watch a football game, right? It's crazy. Right. I love right. it. Well, anyway, we, we will live to see far greater things than even that. 
Uh, I will tell you, you know, people look at me. I was born in the same hospital. Speaking of Steph Curry and LeBron James, I was born in Akron, Ohio at the same hospital as you, those two. Well, you're living as much up to your legacy in sports with Costas, the two bucks, Jack and Joe, and now the fourth great St. Louis journalist and media star, Graham Bessinger. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah.